future. Isn't that what you're after? Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things that you might have missed in the first two episodes of The Bad Batch Season 2. I am so stoked to be back on this season because I think this show is going to be an important bridge between the prequel trilogy and shows like Andor and Obi-Wan Kenobi. Also, I felt like the first season ignored some of the Batch members like Tech and Echo, so it's nice to see them get some attention in these first two episodes. Let me know what you thought of the episode down in the comments, and let's get into this breakdown. The title of the episode is Spoils of War, which has a couple of different meanings. Most obviously, spoils of war refer to any prize the winner of a war can claim. For instance, after World War I, the Allied powers imposed massive reparations on the Central Powers. Or, like when the barbarians sacked Rome, they carried off the gold and riches of that city, and so on and so on. In this episode, the Empire, formerly the Republic, has recently defeated the Separatists in the Clone Wars, so they're looting their planets for everything they can get. Now the thing is, the Clone Wars series gave us a much more nuanced view of the Separatists. The movies only showed us the greedy guilds that were the power behind the movement. But the series showed us Planet Raxus, where ordinary people saw the Confederacy as a chance to obtain greater freedom than the Republic offered. Ooh, you might want to make that Grievous was right video. Hell yeah, high five. Last season, the Bad Batch even traveled to Raxus and defended their former enemies, showing a little bit of character growth that is continuing in these first two episodes. The other meaning of spoils of war is a bit more literal. War has literally spoiled the planet of Sereno. Yeah, what's all this stuff about Dooku being like a king or something? I thought he was a Jedi. Okay, so all of this is actually explained in the audio novel Dooku Jedi Lost, but let's give you a quick summary. And we also went over a lot of this in our Tales of the Jedi Easter egg video if you want to check that one out. So Dooku was actually born into royalty on the planet Sereno. That's the guy who worships Jobu? No, that's Pedro Serrano from Major League. This is planet Sereno. So Dooku was born into this royal family, but when he was a kid, they discovered he was force sensitive and his dad wanted him taken away because he didn't trust the Jedi voodoo magic. Dooku became a distinguished Jedi while his brother, Count Ramil ruled over the planet. Very long story short, Dooku became disillusioned by the Jedi Order, like we saw in Tales of the Jedi. Dooku's brother became like crazy evil and abused the people on the planet, so Dooku was forced to kill his brother, making him the new Count of Sereno. He decided to serve his people instead of the Jedi Order, so he resigned from the Order. But he remained on good terms with the Jedi, still visiting the Temple, which is why he was there during the events of the Phantom Menace, like we saw in Tales of the Jedi. Tell me about this mysterious attacker on Tatooine. And of course, he turns evil, joins Sidious, funds the Confederacy, etc, etc. When he became a Count, Dooku became one of the wealthiest people in the galaxy. And though he took on the job with the noblest intentions, this episode shows us that he was a corrupt leader who picked the pockets of his people for his own pleasure. But more on that in a bit. Now let's get into the breakdown. We open up on where the last season basically left off with the batch running jobs for Sid, voiced by Rhea Perlman. My name is Carla. I'll be your slave for the evil. But notice that at least a year or two has passed because Omega has definitely aged. She was about 12 years old in the first season, but notice how now she is definitely taller. Her hair's grown out a bit and her eyes are drawn just a little bit smaller, indicating that she's aging into those awkward tween years. And a typical teenager, she doesn't like doing her chores. Do I have to do this right now? We're on a mission. Tech is making her study manuals of ships, which luckily comes in handy later in the episode. Containers on class 4 freighters are equipped with re-entry thrusters. We can escape in a cargo container. Tech is making her study the schematics of every ship in the Imperial fleet, and this particular ship is a Nimbus V-Wing Starfighter. They were used by the Galactic Republic in the Clone Wars and were later phased out in favor of TIE Fighters. And these are the same ships on the airfield that we see later on. This opening action sequence already has a big change from last season, when Omega is endangered by the Crab People. <laughs> Omega actually gets herself out of trouble, and she'll do this again and again. And I think this is great because she spends like half the first season getting captured or being in danger. In this season's first scene, the show is sending us a message. She is not a little kid anymore, and she's great with her bow. Then the gang goes back to their smuggler hideout at Ord Mantell, which of course Han Solo first mentioned here. Well, the bonding hunter we ran into when Ord Mandel changed my mind. And as they enter, we see two familiar bar denizens. This Ithorian is named Bolo, and he's with his buddy Ketch, a weak way. And as always, they're playing Dejaric, like we saw several times last season. So because Sid is voiced by Rhea Perlman, I can't help but think that these two pals are a callback to Cliff and Norm from Rhea's other show based in a bar, Cheers. Notice how the little droid AZ-13 is now serving drinks, kind of like Carla did in Cheers. AZ-13 is actually a very sophisticated droid that the Kaminoans used to build the Army of the Republic. Seeing him put into a simple line of work is reminiscent of R2 in Return of the Jedi. <laughs> Well, I can see you're serving drinks, but this place is dangerous. Hey, there's a, a lot of these drags think you said last season. Yeah, I know, but you never know who's watching the videos for the first time. So, sorry if I've repeated some Easter eggs that you already knew. 
For instance, the taps at the bar look like the ones from the Mos Eisley Cantina, which were repurposed as the head of the IG-88 droid in The Empire Strikes Back. And these carryover Easter eggs continue in Sid's office, where we see a Mandalorian helmet and a clone pilot helmet. The collar on this helmet denotes that this is from the 327th Clone Legion, who killed Ayla Sakura in Revenge of the Sith. The channel Star Wars Tonight also theorized that the helmet on the far right is colored white and purple, which would make it from the 108th Legion, which served under Mace Windu, to match the color of his lightsaber. And we're introduced to my new favorite character this season, Fiji. Genoa, played by the great comedian Wanda Sykes. She's a pirate and good friend of Sid's who's going to bring them jobs and team up throughout the season. She points out, Aren't clones supposed to look alike? So much for quality control. And this is actually foreshadowing the end of episode 2 when Captain Wilco easily recognizes their signature armor. Out in the bar, Omega is continuing her studies and the arabesque on this pad reads, Lambda Class Shuttle. And of course, the Lambda Shuttles were used in the Clone Wars and evolved into the Imperial Shuttles like the ones the Rebels stole in Jedi. Then the text reads, A Multipurpose Transport, the Lambda Class Shuttle is equipped with a hyperdrive. And the bottom reads, Armed with one rear double laser cannon, two front wing, and then the bottom text identifies this ship as your mom. So one thing I'm already liking more about this season is that the Bad Batch is at odds with what their mission is. Season 1 is about fighting for survival, but this season is about the fight to live. The question is posed, are we living for ourselves or for others? Hunter has avoided facing Imperial since the last season ended with the attack on Kamino. He would rather Omega be raised in a safe environment away from all this action. But Echo finally gets a character trait and says, With what we're up against, we have to be prepared to fight. We're also seeing fissures within the group, as Echo seems resentful of Omega holding them back. Our lives are like this because of Omega. Maybe there's even some jealousy there since she is a natural born member of the Bad Batch and he was brought on kind of like an honorary member. So this debate about why they fight really speaks to a larger question about what do they want and are they truly free? We're already free. It's cute you think that. Much like Cassie and Andor, the Bad Batch is learning that no one can truly be free while the Empire still rules the galaxy. When they arrive on Sereno, they see that the planet's infrastructure has been destroyed by an Imperial bombardment. I should also mention that Sereno was in several episodes of The Clone Wars, and the first time we saw the world and the palace was in the episode Night Sisters. Dooku's loot is being taken away on giant cargo ships, being protected by the same viewing starfighter that Omega was just learning about. There's a little detail here that shows how far this group has come as a team. When they run onto the ship, Wrecker waits so he can help Omega up too. So at first they think that Dooku's fortune comes from the world he controlled and conquered, you know, like the spoils of war. But as we learn in the next episode, this is actually money that he stole from his own people, which is why the next episode is called The Ruins of War, because the devastation on Sereno shows the consequences of the spoils of war. Dooku did use this money to finance the Separatist movement, and in a way, the Bad Batch have the same goal. They would use this loot to finance a rebellion, one of the many ways that the clones are starting to see that they have more in common with their old enemies, the Separatists. The Imperial Alarm here is the same one from the original trilogy. The windows on Dooku's palace have this really cool Art Deco design, which is very cool for a couple reasons. Art Deco was very popular in America in the 1920s and 30s, and Art Deco design influenced the Flash Gordon serials that inspired George Lucas to create Star Wars. The Naboo Starfighters and the Phantom Menace and the Diplomatic Shuttle at the start of Attack of the Clones were designed to evoke Art Deco designs. So in Star Wars, this sort of craft and care in architecture was destroyed by the Empire, and similarly, we saw Art Deco fade out of fashion after World War II. Dooku having Art Deco windows harkens back to this antebellum period of the Phantom Menace. Later, we see that Dooku's throne is made up of two points, another indication that he's a Sith. This same design is used on Vader's palace, Vader's throne, and for the Grand Inquisitor's chair, as we saw in Kenobi. The two points presumably represent the Sith rule of two, that there can only ever be one master and one apprentice. The throne room was also first seen in the episode Night Sisters, and yes, the window behind him does kind of look like the emblem of the Klingon Empire. <laughs> The arabesque in the throne room reads, personnel, utilities, communications, security, systems, and defense. Wrecker calls these troopers regs, which is how the clones refer to one another. Human troopers are called TK troopers because that is their letter designation. TK-421, why aren't you at your post? I also wonder if that is because the Empire meant to give them a different name and just put TK, TK, TK on the form and never got around to changing it. The troopers guarding the ship are still clone troopers, showing us that the Empire is still phasing them out. And Episode 2 shows us another reason the clones were discarded, which I'll go over a little bit later in the video. Because they're fighting their clone brothers, the Bad Batch use stun grenades. Stun grenades? Have we seen them before? You know, buddy, I had to check, and the only other time they've been in Star Wars was in the 2015 novel Smuggler's Run, a Han and Chewbacca adventure. Oh, please do not give me one more thing to read. I'm still getting through Old Yeller. That's a really good book about a good puppy, and I am enjoying it. Yep. Yeah, you know, maybe, maybe don't finish Old Yeller. Read a Star Wars book instead. Okay. High five. 
Anyways, Omega is wearing a helmet cap very similar to the ones that the Rebels wore on their mission to Endor in Return of the Jedi. And of course, the team gets separated and everything goes sideways. Luckily, Omega has all this new knowledge about ships that allows them to escape. Don't worry, the re-entry thrusters should engage soon. So now we move on to the second episode, Ruins of War, which like I said, has two meanings. Dooku and the Empire have made Sereno a ruin and Hunter and Wrecker have to literally fight through these ruins to escape. And also Tech got a lot to do in this episode. I love how they've kind of amplified his intelligence, like how he's able to calculate the pressure it took to break his leg and he can name the exact bone. I felt like last season, Echo's hardware connection powers made Tech a little redundant, so showing his heightened intelligence is a great change. I mean, after all, he was the one who figured out that Omega was secretly one of the Bad Batch. The fifth is Omega. Tech also shows that his belief in science often locks him into a viewpoint and he's blinded to new possibilities. This was another cool moment in the episode, when Ramar breaks through Tech's views on the Separatists. A Separatist archive. Fascinating. As a soldier, Tech was trained to see the world in black and white, enemies and friends, Separatists and the Republic. But Ramar says, Not Separatist, Serenian. We did exist before the war, you know. Now this is a key moment for Tech because it's when he starts to really grow beyond his programming. I never thought of it like that. If the rebellion against the Empire is going to succeed, former Republic and Separatist forces will have to work together, which actually Luthen spoke about in Andor. We need to pull together, Saul. Whatever our final version of success looks like, there's no chance any of us can make it real on our own. Ramar also gives some perspective to Omega. When he hands her the kaleidoscope, she initially only sees it for its potential value as a way to complete their mission. There are jewels in here? But Ramar tells her it's only a toy and that there's more to life than just missions. It's a toy. Makes you happy. And believe me, that is worth more than any jewel. So the real Sereno spoils of war were the friends we made along the way. Exactly. The leader of the Imperial clones is named Captain Wilco, which feels like a reference to the band Wilco who won a Grammy for an album called Star Wars. And I just have to say, the Commander Wilco's blind adherence to the rules is nothing like the band Wilco, whose fusion of the alternative and country genres has made them a respected outlier in the music industry who have delighted live audiences for decades. Wrecker and Hunter come across some armored assault tanks like we first saw droid armies using in The Phantom Menace. These ships carrying troopers are the low altitude assault transports that we first saw in Attack of the Clones. Now the bikes chasing the Bad Batch at the end are Republic Bark Speeders. The twin engines give this greater stability than the Scout Speeders that we saw in Return of the Jedi, and they do make the same sounds. The climax of the episode is centered around Omega trying to complete the mission, and I'm glad that they gave her a real character motivation for this. Her blind devotion to this mission also set up that she is trying to find some balance between being a soldier and being a kid. Hey kid, keep it. And remember what I said. And her reaching for the treasure at the end seems like an obvious nod at the George Lucas produced Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade. Indiana, let it go. You have to let it go. So the real treasure was a new perspective on childhood all along. Exactly, and the blind devotion to completing a mission also sounds like clones that are still obeying their programming. And this show is all about showing how the Bad Batch is different from clones like Captain Wilco, whose blind service to the rules ends up costing him his life. I will not falsify an official report. I understand. I will. Remember that the clones were basically bred to be obedient, and the few that stray from their programming are the outliers. They are totally obedient, taking any order without question. So, Wilco has a blind devotion to following the letter of the law. Now, in various books, comics, and novels, we see that the imperial hierarchy operates on ambition and fear. The empire failed, in part, because the officers were always fighting each other for a better position because they were afraid of the Emperor. So, clones like Wilco, who follow the rules instead of their officers, are a liability to ambitious Imperials like Rampart. This is another reason why clones were phased out. This murder also shows how the Empire actually viewed clones as entirely disposable units. The faster they die off, the sooner the human conscripts can take over. The heck of it is, if Rampart would have reported the Bad Batch's existence, then maybe they could have captured Omega and used her DNA to help clone Palpatine, as was hinted at in the first season's last scene. And then the Empire would have lived on, but Palpatine's reliance on fear as a governing principle made the Empire rot from the inside out. Well guys, that's all the Easter eggs I found, but if you found any, let me know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.